Hello, my name is Yolanda and I'm a volunteer here at Set Free. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this sermon video. We want to know what special and exciting things God's doing in your life. So if there's anything that we can do to serve you, be in prayer about or celebrate with you, please email us at hello at setfreecf.com or give us a call here at the office at 864-269-3620. We pray that you are blessed by this message. It was a very beautiful spring day in Palestine. Six days the Passover would be happening. In four days, Jesus would be hanging from between earth and heaven. The multitude was already gathering in for the feast. Days before it happened, they would come from all over the world, and every male Jew, 15 years and older, was required to be at Jerusalem. Bethany was one of the little cities outside of Jerusalem where people couldn't find, everyone couldn't find a place to lodge in Jerusalem, so they would stay in Bethany. Jesus had friends in Bethany, real friends, not just acquaintances. Took me a few years of life to learn the difference in friends and acquaintances. If you haven't learned, just keep having birthdays. In John the 12th chapter we read in verse 1, Then Jesus six days before the Passover came to Bethany, where Lazarus, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made a supper, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Everybody say, the house was filled. When you do something special for God, it don't just bless you. It fills the house. I dare you to raise your hand and say, Lord, fill this house with your presence in a special way. It filled the house with the odor of the ointment. Then saith one of the, his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simeon's son, which should betray him. Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor. This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bare what was put therein. It kind of tells me Jesus took offerings. Then said Jesus, let her alone. I want you to look at your neighbor and say, let me alone. If I get happy this morning, leave me alone. If I get beside myself this morning, leave me alone. Let her alone. Against the day of my burying hath she kept this. For the poor always ye have with you, but me ye have not always. In Matthew's rendering of this event, in Matthew, I believe it's the 26th chapter, we have another character that was in this story, and his name was Simon the leper. And the, in Matthew it says that this happened at Simon the leper's house. 
So we have about five characters this morning I would like to share with you. We're going to talk about, first of all, Simon the leper. We read the story in Matthew the 8th chapter where a leper came running to Jesus. And he fell down at his feet and he said, Master, if thou wilt, thou can make me whole. Oh, hallelujah. Jesus reached out and touched him. Number one, you don't touch a leper. That was a no-no. That was a contagious disease. You, you, you don't touch a leper. Number two, the leper should have never approached Jesus because a leper never should actually ever approach any person without screaming and hollering, unclean, unclean. But we don't find this with Simon that run to Jesus and fell at his feet. He just said, Lord, have mercy. If you want to, you can make me whole. There comes a time when you can't just listen to protocol. You can't just do what's nice and neat. Sometimes when you get desperate enough, you just have to do what you have to do. And Simon said, this is my only opportunity. This is a time that I can touch him. So many times we wait for the right time, the right moment when we think everything's right to touch God. And I'm telling you, friend... Oh, my friend, just reach out and touch him. He's passing by right now. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Simon said, Lord, you can make me whole. And the Lord reached out and touched him, and he was immediately cleansed from his leprosy. Beautiful skin appeared on his body. Where the leprosy had eat away at his, maybe his fingers and some of his body parts, suddenly... Simon had new fingers, beautiful skin. Jesus said, now, Simon, I want you to go and show yourself to the priest. That was the law. Show yourself to the priest and let them decree that you're clean. And when they see you're clean and cleansed, then you can, they'll let you go out and live a normal life. Simon went and sold himself to the priest and but why was this happening at Simon the leper's house? Evidently, Simon had got a clean bill of health. And he was able to go back to Bethany and live. And now, six or four days before Jesus would be in Pilate's hall and, and be crucified... Simon didn't forget what the Lord done for him. I'm going to talk about some character sketches here. Number one, Simon's act of love was gratitude. Everybody say gratitude. gratitude. He was grateful that Jesus was willing to reach out and touch a leper. He was grateful that he spoke those words, I will be thou clean and be thou healed. He was grateful. Every one of us in this room this morning, you're going to find yourself in this story. One of these characters will be you. Will it be Simon the leper that is grateful? That the Lord cleansed him of all of his uncleanness and his disease. Has anybody in here ever had a miracle of healing? Just raise your hand. Oh, hallelujah. Somebody help me praise God in this room. Oh, I said, have you told him how much you appreciate that miracle lately? Have you told him how much it means to you that he touched you when he did? You see, gratefulness and gratitude touches the heart of God quicker than anything. Enter into His presence with what? Oh, I can't hear you. 
Somebody help me preach. You're going to help me preach this morning. I said, enter into his presence with what? Gratitude touches the heart of God. If you want to get close to God, just show him how grateful you are. I learned that as a child by my mother. I could get anything I wanted, just tell her how good her biscuits was. How good that dinner was. Oh, mama, that's the best I've ever eaten. Look up at her with my brown eyes. She said, what do you want, Jimmy? <laughs> oh, hallelujah. If you'll just, if you'll just brag on Jesus and, and be grateful, I believe you can get just about anything you need in, from Him. Somebody help me praise God. Be grateful. Simon the leper was grateful. He opened his home up to Jesus. Just before he would suffer, Jesus knew there was someone that didn't forget what he'd done for him. Simon the leper, God help me be grateful like Simon the leper. You see, because we all were leprous. Why? Because sin had us all diseased in our heart, in our mind, in our spirit. But Jesus passed by. The second character sketch in this story is we have a, a woman called uh, Martha. Now the Bible says in Matthew and in Mark that Martha cooked Jesus a meal. I'm talking about this special week. Martha cooked Jesus probably the last good meal he would eat before he suffered. How many of you would have liked to have prepared a good meal for Jesus right before he went to the cross? How many of you would have fixed something very special for him? Hello, operator. Hook me back up with some of these folks. How many of you would have got out your best dishes? And your best plates and your best silverware and your best tablecloth. And how many would have prepared a beautiful place for Jesus to eat this last meal? Not the last supper or Passover. He did that with the disciples. But this last meal, just a good meal before he suffered. You see, you never know when someone, it may be the last time, you can show an act of kindness, an act of love. Don't put it off. Martha would never get another opportunity to prepare another meal. Now, what's the story behind Martha's character? Martha served with her hands. She wasn't talented. She couldn't sing like a mockingbird. Hello? Martha didn't have a lot of other gifts. But she was a wonderful cook. Come on, somebody help me praise God. Oh, you say, well, that don't mean... Oh, you know, you can serve God in the kitchen just like you can on the pulpit and the platform. Somebody help me praise God. You don't have to be on a platform to serve God. You can be in a kitchen over a stove and prepare a meal for somebody that's hurting and needs a meal. Oh, that's serving God. Martha was doing what she could, what she did best. Ask yourself, am I a Martha? Am I a Martha? Am, am I, I may not can sing up here in the choir or sing like that young lady that sung that beautiful song. Everybody reach out your hands and say, I can do something for God with my hands. Ooh, hallelujah, praise God. Oh, I, I feel some, somebody ought to praise the Lord. I think I ought to get a good hand clap right now. Praise God. Amen. 
You know, one time Martha was cooking a meal for Jesus, not, not this occasion, but another time. And, and Mary got kind of, I mean, Martha got kind of upset because Mary wasn't helping her. You have to be careful when you're working with your hands. You'll think, you know, well, why ain't so-and-so helping? Lord, have mercy. Praise God. Pat me on the back and say, that's good preaching. Thank you. Praise God. Well, if I've got to do this, why ain't so-and-so got to do it? Lord, I've done, I've done quit preaching, going to meddling now. Praise God. So-and-so ain't doing nothing. Martha said, Jesus, make Mary come and help me. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. I'm telling you one thing. If God's blessed you, praise God, with a talent of, of working with your hands, praise God, do something for God. If you do something for the hungry, you're doing something for God. If you do something for the suffering, you're doing something for God. Hallelujah. Oh, use those hands. Martha, use what you had. She worked with her hands. I remember in Florida I was pastoring there and a lady brought in one day she brought in she was kind of home well not homebound but she couldn't get out much but she wanted to do something for God she come in one Sunday they brought her in she had a little pillow she had made she said pastor said I want to show you what I do I can't get out and visit. I can't get out. I'm not fishing. He said, but I make these little pillows. And for people who's going through cancer, I write these scriptures on these pillows. He said, I give them to these people. Beautiful little pillows. She was a seamstress. Oh, you know who the first woman to ever be raised from the dead in the New Testament? She wasn't a great preacher. She wasn't a great singer. Dorcas. The Bible says she was a seamstress. And people brought in clothes. She had made clothes for little children. She had made clothes for the homeless and those that couldn't, couldn't buy clothes. Dorcas made clothes for them. And when she died, they come and they brought in these clothes and everybody was showing, look what she made me. Look what she made me. Peter went over there, praise God, hallelujah. Peter went over there and spoke in the name of Jesus, hallelujah, come back to life. And she came back to life, hallelujah. Oh, why? Because I believe she did what she could. Don't ever judge what you're doing by what somebody else is doing. Don't ever judge your success by somebody else's success. Just recently we, uh, we lost one of the greatest Christian evangelists perhaps in the, in the history of the church. I looked at some of the documentaries and things about him and I thought, what an awesome ministry. He preached more than one congregation than I preach in my life. But you know what? Praise God. I'm going to keep preaching. Praise God. I said, I'm going to keep preaching. I may not fill a stadium, but oh, when I get to heaven, if there's somebody there that I've helped get there, oh, that'll be worth it all. Somebody help me praise God. Hallelujah. Oh, wave your hand around a little bit and tell Jesus you love him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, yes. I ask you to just raise your hand and say, Lord, make me a Martha. Use my hands to do something for you. <laughs> and, then, and then the next character in this story we have is a, a man called Lazarus. 
I don't have to tell you a story about Lazarus, do I? They sent Jesus a news. Your friend is sick. Come and pray for him. Four days later, he showed up. Now, if that was a pastor, you'd have probably lost a good family. <laughs> Smile, you're on God's camera. Praise God. He showed up four days later. And Mary met him. Mary Martha and they said, Master, if you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. In other words, why, are you, why did you take so long? Why didn't you show up when we sent for you? Now, let's don't criticize them much. We say the same thing. Lord, why hadn't you answered my prayer yet? Whoa, go ahead. Why hadn't you worked that miracle yet? Why hadn't you worked out that problem yet, Lord? You should have showed up a long time ago. I'm going to preach over here. These folks act like they, love, they want to hear me. Praise God. It said, yeah. Lord, I don't understand why I hadn't got an answer yet. You're late. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. Oh, Jesus is the only one I know can be four days late and still be on time. <laughs> praise God. Somebody praise Him in the house. Hallelujah. <laughs> he may not come when you want Him, but He's right on time. Hallelujah. David said, wait on the Lord and be of good cheer. Wait, I say, on the Lord. <laughs> Woo, hallelujah. Oh, I felt... I felt current go through my, my legs. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Some of you are wondering right now, God, why hadn't you saved that loved one? Why hadn't you worked that miracle? Why hadn't you touched that body? Why hadn't you worked out this situation in my family? I'm telling you, hallelujah. The answer's on the way. Hallelujah. The way maker's on the way. Be patient. Wait upon the Lord. The Bible said that Abraham, through faith and patience, inherited the promise. Oh, if I didn't want to finish this message so bad, I'd, I'd just shout the rest of the morning. Somebody shout for me. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise His name. Hallelujah. Yes. Look at your neighbor and say, the answer's on the way. Praise God. There was that. I want you to. I want you to understand. I want to set the scene here. Now we got a, a meal set, a table set. Now in those days they didn't have chairs. They didn't sit around like we do. They reclined upon couches. And I want you to kind of get the picture. Here at one end we got Jesus reclining. On the other end we have Lazarus who four days uh, earlier, or excuse me, who a few days earlier was dead. He's on the other end. How'd you like to eat a meal like that? <laughs> on one side was Martha, and the other side was her sister. And then you got Simon the leper. And they were all around the table. One was grateful. One done what she could with her hands. And now here's Lazarus. How can, just try to imagine the feelings that was going through Lazarus' mind. He knew what it was to close his eyes in death. And then hear a voice say, Lazarus, come forth. 
Somebody said if Jesus hadn't specified Lazarus, the whole graveyard would have got up. Praise God. Somebody <laughs> praise God. Lazarus, come forth. I believe that Lazarus remembered when he come out of that tomb, he was still bound with grave clothes all around him. His arms were wrapped with linens and his legs and torso. And they took that old napkin off his face that they always put on their face when they died. He come out of that tomb and Jesus said, loose him and let him go. Hallelujah. Oh, I dare you to praise God. Look at your neighbor and say, loose me. Hallelujah. I, I'm, not, I'm alive. God's resurrected me, but loose me, Lord, and let me go. Some of you are still bound by guilt. Some of you are still bound by situation. Some of you, your praise is still bound. Oh, yes, you're alive and you're, you're not in your stands. But, oh, you need to be loose. Get the grave clothes off of you. Hallelujah. Be loosed and praise God like you should. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So, you can understand how Lazarus would have felt, how grateful, oh my, that Jesus finally showed up. I, I have served, I have saved this life character sketch for Mary. I, there's something very special about Mary. She was the only one at the cross other than the mother of Jesus. She was the first one at the tomb on resurrection morning. Isn't it amazing? <laughs> God used a woman to preach the first resurrected message. He said, go back and tell my disciples I'm alive. Hallelujah. Somebody. <laughs> Ooh, hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. There's something special about Mary. And the Bible says that when they were there eating, Mary took a pound of ointment of spikenard. Now, in Matthew and Mark, they specify how much that would have cost. Well, they do here in John. It says, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? 300 pence was the average year's wages of a person in that day. Oh, I don't know if you heard me or not. I said 300 pence was the average wage of a person in that day. Pastor was talking about the average uh, wage in Dominican, 200 a month. 300 pence was the average wage that a person would earn in a whole year. And she took this very precious ointment Oh, how let take your seatbelt off. It's fixing to get good. Praise God, you don't want to be held down. And she spilled it all upon Jesus. Matthew said she broke the box. I don't know how they use the different adjectives, but what I do know is she didn't hold any of it back. She spilled it all upon Jesus. If you're going to do something for God, don't hold back. Give Him all of it. Give Him all of you. Give Him all of your praise, all of your heart. These people are just afraid they're going to do too much for God. I'm not praising too much. Praise God. You keep that up, I'm going to start dancing, Aaron. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Just keep it up. You, every time you hit that organ, it sends a, a, something up my spine. Yes, oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. <laughs> Mary spilt the ointment on Jesus. I call it extravagant love. Everybody say extravagant love. Oh, say it like you mean it. 
You see, love is not love if you calculate the cost. Love isn't love if you calculate how much, how far, how long. Love only becomes love when you give it all. For God so loved the world, He gave one of His angels. Oh, excuse me. I didn't quote that right, did I? For God so loved the world that He gave one of His sons. His what? His what? Oh, I, I can't hear you. Somebody help me. I've had my. Oh, you mean he gave his best? He gave his only son. The one that had been in his bosom since the beginning of creation. I'm going to give you my best. I'm going to give you my all. I, I get alarmed today at Christians. Oh, they don't want to be lost and go to hell. We know that. But they're still not ready to give it all. They still hold little reservations to do their own thing. I don't know if they're in that way in South Carolina, but in Tennessee they're that way. They still like to kind of calculate, what's this going to cost me if I follow Jesus? But I want to tell you something, praise God, when you fall in love with Him. I said, when you fall in love with Him. Oh, when you fall in love with Him. Paul said, who shall separate me from the love of Christ? Hallelujah. Oh, there'll be nothing, life, nor death, nor things present, nor things to come can separate you from the love of Christ. Because you're in love. Extravagant love. Mary was extravagant. If it was a little vial of oil, you know they make these little vials where they put perfume in it. Any of you ladies got one? Surely somebody in here's got one. Anyway, yeah, yeah, little vials. You know, she could have, uh, uh, uh oh, I, I see, yeah, somebody's got one. Here, hand it to me. Now, if, I don't know what the alabaster file or whatever you call it was it was a box they called it in one of the writers box what a, the alabaster itself was very precious but Mary could have said Lord now you know I really thank you because most folks think and scholars believe that Mary was Mary Magdalene the one Jesus delivered from seven demons hello and, and, and she could have said, now, Lord, I remember when I had seven demons and, and I really was tormented. My life was in shambles and shame and disgrace. She said, I want to do something special. I'm going to squirt a little bit on you. <laughs> Lord, I want to give you just a little bit of praise. <laughs> Lord, I just want to give you a little bit of thanksgiving. Lord, I just want to do a little bit for you to let you know I appreciate you delivering me from seven demons. No, no. The Bible says she break the box. Hallelujah. And the whole house was full of the odors. Hallelujah. When you're in love, hallelujah, you don't see how little you can do. Oh, no. When you're in love, you say, oh, the only thing I regret is I don't have more that I can give. Somebody praise God. Three things about extravagant love we find here. Number one, we find that extravagant love takes the most precious thing that she had. Love is not love if it nicely calculates the cost. When the young man and young woman stand before a minister and they take their marriage vows, uh, that's why they say, for better or worse, rich or poor. Uh, you're counting the cost. 
And the answer is not maybe. <laughs> Sister Leona, I've been married 53 years. Somebody asked her, said, have you put up with him for 53 years? She said, well, when we got married, we took a covenant. For better or worse. He couldn't have done no better and I couldn't have done no worse. So I'm just going to do Extravagant love doesn't calculate. I read the story about a young couple that just got married and they were very poor. They, when they got married, they didn't have anything. The, lady, the young lady's name was Dellen. The boy was Jim. And it was coming Christmas. They didn't have no money. The, lady, the girl had about a dollar eighty-two cents. The only thing the boy had was he had a watch that had been handed down from his father that he treasured very much. It was very the most precious thing that he possessed. They were thinking, what are we going to do for each other? So Della decided she had long hair. It was like a robe. When she took her hair down, it just flowed down. She heard about this place where they made uh, artificial hair pieces for people with disease and cancer. So she went and sold. She cut her hair off and sold it for $20 to buy Jim a Christmas present. Her hair was her glory. She treasured it. She cut it off. Well, Jim was in a predicament. He didn't know what he was going to buy, so he decided he would sell the most precious thing he possessed, that watch that was handed down from his father to him. He sold it for $20. Della went and bought Jim a little case to hold his watch in. Because she knew how much he treasured that watch. She wanted a nice case. Jim went and bought Della some beautiful hair combs with jewels and things in it to plait through her hair. Jim walked in, he looked at Della, and she, he was shocked. Never seen her with her hair cut off. It's not that she wasn't beautiful and pretty, but he just he didn't, never known her like that. But he handed her his gift of those beautiful combs that you just pull your hair up with. Jewels sparkling. She handed Jim his little case for his watch. They didn't have much, but they give all they had. They give the most precious thing they had. The moral of that story is when you love, nothing is too great a sacrifice. Mary said, I may not get this opportunity again. Seems like she was intuitive enough to know that the end was coming. And she said, I may not get another opportunity to tell him I love him. I'm going to give him all I got. I'm going to give him the best that I can give him. Oh, I'm going to pour it all on him. You say, what does that have to do with me? My friend, you're not promised tomorrow. This may be the last Sunday morning that you'll be in church. Oh, hallelujah. You need to praise him this morning for what he's done for you. Hallelujah. Love, extravagant love is love that doesn't calculate the cost. And then we see love's humility. Everybody say love's humility. Mary 
did not feel honored. In that day, it was an honor bestowed on a person if they anointed your head. You were an honorable person to anoint someone's head. That's why David said in Psalm 23, Thou anointest my head with oil. It was an honor if you anointed. You were the honored one to anoint somebody. Mary did not think of herself honorable enough to anoint Jesus' head. She anointed His feet. Good God Almighty. I said she anointed his feet. True love is hum- it has humility. It doesn't seek the highest place. It doesn't seek to be noticed. It doesn't seek to be honored. Love just says, hallelujah, I want to do something for you. Mary did not feel honored, honorable enough to anoint his head. So she anointed his feet. How many people today that if, 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 if they're in a position where they can be seen and honored and recognized. Oh, it's getting quiet in here now. They'll do something. <laughs> But Mary said, Lord, just let me get at your feet. Now, not only was it love, extravagant love, it doesn't count the cost. Number two, it doesn't. And love is hum- love's humility. Extravagant love is, has humility about it. It doesn't do it to be seen. She didn't do this so everybody said, look what Mary's doing. Mm, Praise God. Pat me on the back and say, preach on. Thank you. I was anyway. I just wanted you to tell me. (laughs) No, love is humble. And then the third thing about extravagant love. Unself-consciousness. It doesn't care what you think. You see, in that day, it was not, a woman was not supposed to have, her hair was not supposed to be let down in public. Always was bound up in public. If a woman let her hair down in public, among people, it was considered she was an immoral woman. Some of you are looking at me funny. Yes. People thought, that's not, that's not appropriate. Hello. But Mary could not care less what other folks thought. You can thank whatever you want to. I'm taking my hair down and I'm going to dry his feet with my hair. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, praise God. Are you worried about what people think? Are you worried about, oh, if I get happy, I wonder if they'll, what they'll think. If I get excited this morning, will they think I'm, you know, going overboard? What will they think when you have extravagant love? Hallelujah. You are unself conscious of what People think, hallelujah, all you want to do is honor and praise the King of glory. Who is the King of glory? It's the Lord. I got to hurry. It's already 10.59. I got to, that's in Alabama. Praise God, I'm on Alabama time. It wouldn't be right to finish this message if I didn't talk about the final character sketch in this story. His name is Judas. Judas was chosen by Jesus to be one of the 12 special disciples. Now, I'm not going into all the theological sides of that, whether 
I'm sure the Bible says Jesus knew all men and he knew what Judas would finally do, but he still chose him. Judas got to follow Jesus when he healed the sick. When he opened Bartimaeus' eyes. Judas was there and saw when he made the lame to walk. He probably was there when Jesus interrupted the, 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 the uh, uh, funeral of the widow of Nain and he raised her son up. Oh, Judas got to see some wonderful things, miraculous things. And Judas had an honorable place. You see, when Somebody says, I want you to carry my money. Hey, they, they pretty well trust you. Yeah, that's right. That's what I tell Leona. You know, she's got my money. Praise God. I call her Leona Bank and Trust. Praise God. She's my ATM. When you give somebody the liberty and the privilege to hold all the money, you're saying to them, I trust you. I have confidence in you. And here's a man that Jesus trusted with the money. But you see, in desperate times or in certain certain times in in a situation you'll find the true character of a person coming out all you have to do is give them the liberty just give them the opportunity and the real person will come out (laughs) Judas kind of hid his selfishness he kind of hid his greed the other apostles probably didn't notice it They just thought, well, Judas is carrying the money. They didn't realize what was brewing down underneath the greed for money. The selfishness. You see, Judas said, why why couldn't we have sold this? He did not have any kind of inclination of what was going to happen. Judas didn't even care. He didn't care Jesus would in a few days would be beaten to a pulp and look like beef steak. He didn't care that they would nail spikes through his hands. Let me tell you something, friend. You live in a world that's driven by greed. Everywhere you go, this whole world is driven by greed. Every evil in this world is driven by money. You take money out of drugs. If you tell them uh, down at the border where they ship it all in, saying, well, now you'd ship all you want to in, but we're not going to give you no money for it. You'd stop the drug trade. (laughs) Human trafficking is all because of greed, money. That's why the Bible said the love of money is the root of all evil. Money is not evil. It's the love of it. Praise God. Hallelujah. Oh, You see, but Judas didn't value. He didn't know what was valuable. Here he was serving with the king of glory. Walking, talking, eating beside the king of glory. And his mind was on money. Now, oh, I don't want to put a cold damper on this service this morning. And how many people, when it comes time to give, they kind of calculate what, well, let's see, I got this, I got that, and I want to do this, and I want to do that, and if I do this, and I can't do that, and and they keep calculating, they just keep talking to themselves out of giving, finally they'll drop a dollar in. Oh, yes. Let me tell you something. When you're in love, you don't care what it costs. You'll take the last dime you got. 
And you will give it to that person you love. When Jesus saw the little widow woman in the temple, and they were all casting in their great offerings. And here come a little widow woman. I, I, she cast in just a widow's mite. I don't know. It's, about, it's not even worth two pennies. Hold your hand there. That's all she had. Jesus was standing by the collection box. And he saw it and he said to his disciples, so you see that widow woman? He says, she has given more than them all. Oh, hallelujah. She has given more. Than, uh, the man before that, the great Pharisee, dropped in a, a real good offering. You see, when you give, God doesn't look at how much you give. He looks at how much you got left. <laughs> oh, you didn't get that. Somebody didn't get that. I said, when you give, God don't look at how much you give. He looks at how much you got left. When the widow woman gave, what did she have left? I said, when the widow woman gave, what did she have left? That's why Jesus said she's given more than everybody. She's given all she has. Now, it's hard now to get folks to give a dime out of a dollar. I mean in Tennessee, not down here in South Carolina. I understand that. I had somebody come up to me one time and said, uh, Pastor, do, are you supposed to give a tithe on your gross income or your net? I knew right then they was calculating how little they could give. Oh, hallelujah. If you can't say amen, nod your head or do, or do something. <laughs> Judas finally sold completely out for 30 pieces of silver because he loved money. More than he loved God. You love possessions more than the Creator. What do you love the most? If I were to ask you this morning, what do you love the most? Oh, we love our families. I know that. We love our children. I know that. But Jesus said, any man that loves mother, father, son, or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. It, it, did he say that? Am I, am I just saying something off the top of my head? But did Jesus say that? In other words, Jesus said, if you don't love me more than you love anything else, you don't really love me. You know, if you don't love Jesus more than you love anything else, you know who you're going to love the most? Self. Come on, somebody say amen. It ain't going to be family. It's not going to be children. If you don't love Jesus more than you love Him, it's going to be self. You're going to love this self. You're going to get what you want. You're going, to, and you're going to satisfy the things that you want. Oh, but if you love Jesus, hallelujah. Oh, thank God you're going to say, Lord, not my will, but thine be done. What do you want, God? You want my donkey to ride? That's fine. I'll let you have it. Extravagant love. This morning, I challenge you, this week, ask the Lord, Lord, how much do I love you? I don't question how much He loves me. He proved it when He stretched His arms out and they nailed Him to an old cross. He proved, what he, he, proved he loved me. What the question is, how much do I love Him? Do I love Him more than... Friends, they love him more than possessions, 
Yes, we all need things to live, exist, homes, beds, cars. That's just stuff that's going to rust. And if you die, somebody else is going to use it. But if you don't love Jesus more than you love anything, you know what? Sooner or later, something's going to come along. And you're going to leave Jesus. You're going to follow it. Because you can't serve two masters at one time. You'll love the one or you'll hate the other. You cannot serve two masters. You must put him first. Let's bow our head. Father, I thank you for this time together. Thank you for your word this morning. I thank you for your sweet presence. I hope, Lord, I pray that I have done this story justice. You deserve the best. And Lord, I pray that not a person will leave this room that will not see themselves in one of these characters. We all fit somewhere here. Let me be a Martha that will use my hands. Lord, let me be a Simon the leper that will not forget and be grateful. Lord, let me be a Lazarus that will sit and admire and wonder at you that you could raise him from the dead. And Lord, above all, let me be a Mary that will love you extravagantly and give you my all. Hallelujah. If you would like prayer or to talk with someone, please contact the church office at 864-269-3620 or at hello at setfreecf.com. It is because of your generosity that we're able to expand our reach for the kingdom. So if you're blessed by this ministry and would like to donate, please visit setfreecf.com forward slash give. Thanks again for joining us today and we pray you have a wonderful week.